as a creative outlet. As a child, she wrote poems and short stories. Later, she drew upon her experience in music ministry and ventured into songwriting. Note-taking during her quiet time led Michelle into a deeper and more intimate relationship with God. And it was from these study notes that her first book, A Woman's Bible Study on the Life of Jacob, was drawn. As an army brat, Michelle has lived in some interesting places such as Alaska, New Mexico, but returned to her native Baton Rouge, Louisiana. In 1989, earning her BA and attending graduate school at LSU, she remains a die-hard Tiger fan. Woo! <coughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> Michelle and her husband have been blessed by their six wonderful children in their teens, 20s through 30s, and God has brought into their lives. She loves being a stay-at-home mom and a homeschool veteran and enjoys reading, staying active at church and in women's ministry, spending time with family and training Christian women to grow in their knowledge of Christ and his word through her blog, speaking engagements around the country, and a word fitly spoken, a podcast she co-hosts with Amy Spreeman. So thank you for joining us, Michelle, and I'll leave it to you now. <laughs> I'm glad you read that again. I didn't catch last night. It says uh, teens, 20s, and 30s, and my youngest just turned 20 in June, so i got to take that part out. <laughs> um, thank you all so much for being here this morning. Thank you all for your hospitality so much. Um, Y'all have been so very kind to me and so very welcoming, and I appreciate that. And that is also a good sign of a healthy church, that you welcome people in. So I'm, I'm excited about that. <laughs> do want to remind you that our last session today is going to be a Q&A session, and I believe we have, uh, you have in your, your booklets there a little notes page for questions and answers that you might think of as we're going along today. Uh, so you can jot questions down on there if you want to. And then we also have on the corner of the booth back there, a basket with some cards that you can write your questions down on. I think that's what I'm going to be given for the Q&A session. Yes, okay, I think so. I do want to tell you that um, questions can be about anything that we're talking about today or something totally unrelated. Um, if I don't know the answer, I will send you to your pastor. I'm sure your pastor will know the answer. But also, you're welcome to write down as many questions as you like, but write down your most important question first, because what we'll do is we'll go through and I'll do the first question that everybody submits, and then afterwards, if we have time, we'll get to the remainder of your questions. So, because sometimes it can take a while, and I know, you know, at the end of the day, you don't want to be here all day. So. All right, so our first session here is Hooked on a Feeling, Living by God's Word Instead of Our Emotions. Now, just so I can feel really old, how many of y'all got the reference to the song in the title? Okay, good. Some of my homies. All right, good. <laughs> well, <laughs> if the, yeah, yes. <laughs> For the, for the chronologically disadvantaged among us, uh, if you don't know that song, you can Google it. I'm not recommending it. I don't remember all the words to it, so I'm sure some of the, some of the words are probably not very godly, so anyway. But have you noticed that a lot of people today, both inside and outside the church, seem to live life as though they're being led around by the nose by their feelings, Okay. Um, think, just take a moment right now, think of some examples you've seen, maybe just in society in general, or maybe an example that you've seen personally, or, you know, of a situation in which someone is letting her feelings dictate what she does in life. Maybe you've even done that. I know I have at times. So keeping those examples in mind, just a few that, that I've thought of, or one that I've thought of to start off with, being in love can make you do some pretty stupid things and make some bad decisions, right? It can cause you to give up your virginity before marriage. It can cause you to do things that you know are wrong and so on. Like every episode of Dateline starts this way, right? You know, I just loved him so much. I had no idea he was gonna rob six banks and I'd be the getaway driver, you know. <laughs> so being in love. Anger can cause you to say hurtful things, just like Debbie was just telling us, can cause you to make rash decisions and so on. Or what about a girl who feels like she's a boy um, and begins living life pretending she is a boy? Those are just some examples of people making decisions based on their feelings. 
And where do our feelings, metaphorically speaking, come from? The heart, right? And we hear phrases like, the heart wants what it wants. Follow your heart. Broken hearted. From the bottom of my heart, right? With a heavy heart. And if you're old enough to remember the movie Titanic, if you're Celine Dion, my heart will go on. Okay, it's been a while since an audience got the answer to that one. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're pretty young sometimes, but uh, we hear phrases like this all the time. And then we get to the Bible. And what does the Bible say about our hearts? That's right, Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. Think about that, above all things, right, and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Well, doesn't that just stomp all over our precious little romantic notions of the heart, you know, and its feelings? So as Christians, what it boils down to, as with almost everything else in the Christian life, is this. The world tells us one thing. The Bible tells us something else. Which one are we going to believe and obey? Now, we're all good little Sunday school girls here, and uh, we know the right Christian answer to give is, well, of course, we believe and obey the Bible. And that should be a no-brainer, although more and more we're hearing remarks you know, from people who claim to be Christians that are attempting to unravel this most basic of Christian concepts. Let's take this quote that I heard a couple of years ago, and we're going to use it as an example to work from. Now, I'm going to read it to you, and I'm going to give you a few moments to just jot down some ways that this woman who's saying this quote is living and making decisions based on her feelings rather than based on Scripture. Okay? Listen carefully. When my religion tries to come between me and my neighbor, I will choose my neighbor. That self-canceling feature of my religion is one of the things that I like best about it. Jesus never commanded me to love my religion. Okay, so be thinking about how is she living by her feelings rather than God's word as evidenced by this quote. I'm going to read it to you again and then I'll wait just a few minutes. She says, when my religion tries to come between me and my neighbor, I will choose my neighbor. That self-canceling feature of my religion is one of the things that I like best about it. Jesus never commanded me to love my religion. Okay, so how is she living by her feelings rather than God's word? So just, I'll give you a second to jot that down. This is the quietest I've heard y'all this weekend. That's good, you're thinking. Okay, what are some ways that it sounds like this lady is living by her emotions or her feelings, her fleshly desires, instead of living by God's word? Any thoughts? Compromising, Compromising. okay. Anybody else? She's living her feelings to determine what religion is. That's right. She's using her feelings to determine what religion is to her. Anybody else? Okay. This quote and this woman herself are a study in living by your feelings. This is a quote from the book Holy Envy, Finding God in the Faith of Others, written by Barbara Brown Taylor, who before eventually walking away from any semblance of Christianity whatsoever, was for many years an Episcopal priest. So let's take a look at this. We're going to break it down. She says, when my religion, and her religion supposedly is Christianity, she says, when my religion comes between me and my neighbor, I will choose my neighbor. Okay, so we're going to hold it right there. Does Christianity ever come between you and your neighbor to the point where you have to put aside Christianity in order to do right by your neighbor? No, of course not. Christianity is all about laying your life down for your neighbor, serving your neighbor, loving your neighbor as yourself. The Bible says so in John 15, 13 and Luke 10, 25 through 37. But because, her, because of her feelings for her neighbor and her feelings about what the Bible says, 
she has decided that if she ever feels like Christianity is forcing her to choose between God's word and her neighbor, she's going to choose her neighbor. That happens every day, you know. You're a Christian. You feel like sharing the gospel with your neighbor would offend her. So you put Christianity aside and you choose your neighbor's feelings instead. Or your professing Christian neighbor on the other side is shamelessly committing adultery. Okay? She needs a good godly rebuke and a call to repentance. But her husband isn't very nice and she seems so happy now. So you and your husband put aside your Christianity and just go out to dinner with her and the new boyfriend and, you know, kind of affirm them in that. So you see what I mean? It's really subtle. It can creep into even our lives. The title of Barbara's book is Holy Envy. Can envy ever be holy? No, the Bible says so in Mark 7, 21 through 23. It says that envy is a sin. And Isaiah 5, 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. But she feels it can be holy. The remainder of the title is Finding God in the Faith of Others. And if you read the book description, she's not talking about finding out how God is working in the lives of your brothers and sisters in Christ. She's talking about finding God in Buddhism or Hinduism or whateverism because she feels like you can find God in those religions, even though the Bible says in John 14, 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. Then Barbara walked away from the church in whatever version of Christianity she was practicing at that time because she felt like it, even though the Bible says in Hebrews 10.25 that we are not to forsake gathering together. And then we've got the fact that Barbara is a priest, which as a woman, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2.12 that she is not to do. But she became a priest because she felt like she wanted to be a priest. So do you sense that tension between I feel and the Bible says? It's almost palpable. And do you see that in every decision that Barbara made, she first had to reject what the Bible plainly says? Okay, That's what's going on in the church and in the hearts and lives of so many evangelical women today. Now, just to be clear, don't hear what I'm not saying, okay? No one is saying that it's wrong or unbiblical to have emotions or to express emotions uh, as long as we do it in a godly way. God created us with emotions. Jesus expressed a wide variety of emotions uh, when he was here on earth. So we know that simply having emotions or expressing those emotions in a non-sinful way is not wrong. It, it brings glory to God because we're created in his image. What we're talking about here is letting your emotions control your life and control your decision-making processes instead of scripture, okay? Letting your feelings lead you. It could be a decision as big as who you're going to marry or whether or not to buy a house. Or it could be something as run-of-the-mill as deciding to keep your mouth shut, you know, when you just want to feel that, <laughs> when you want to feel that fleshly gratification of having the perfect comeback that would just really put that lady in her place, you know. Or maybe deciding to take care of your responsibilities around the house when what you feel like doing is sitting around in your jammies and watching Netflix all day. Hmm? Oh, I didn't hear too many amens on that. The, the Lord is convicting some people this morning. We live in a world where people are letting their feelings run their lives. Okay, It's pretty easy to see in, for example, a, <coughs> a man who feels like he's a woman and is surgically altering his body to try to make that a reality. But look how subtly it's creeping into the church and even into our own hearts without us even realizing it. So the first thing we've got to address 
when we tackle this issue, and we've already touched on it a little bit, is, and it's right there on your handout, why should we live by God's word instead of our emotions? And where do you think we're going to find the answer to that question? That's right, in the Bible. So first of all, number one, emotions can be deceptive. Okay, we've already looked at Jeremiah 17, 9, but let's quickly go back over that. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful. There's your deception right there. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Well, I don't know about you, but I think that's a pretty good argument for not following your heart or living your life by your feelings. It makes sense logically. I mean, why would anyone let something sick and deceitful lead her through life, right? Any thinking person would say that that's a recipe for disaster. It makes sense experientially. We know from experience that our hearts can lead us astray. And it makes sense authoritatively. God is the creator of your heart, and he says not to follow it because it's deceitful. Who knows better how the heart operates than the one who created it? We need to obey him simply because he is God and he knows best. And just a little aside here, do understand that in this context, in Jeremiah 17, 9, we're talking about the heart as the seat of fleshly emotions, okay, or, or your fleshly desires. We're not talking about the heart in the salvific sense that when God saves you, you become a new creation and he gives you a new heart. So, you know, like a new nature, a new spirit that desires to obey God. So two different contexts, two different metaphors, two different meanings of the word heart here. So we know that in this context of fleshly emotion or emotional desires that we shouldn't be following our hearts. But human beings are created to be followers. That's just how God wired us. We all follow something as our God in life. And if it's not going to be our heart, then what should we be following? The human heart craves stability and assurance. We want an unchanging standard, something we can bet our lives on. We long for something that won't let us down, that we can trust in every single situation in life. And guess what? There's a God for that, okay? Our hearts were uniquely created to follow God. And when you follow God, he is your authority. He is your master. So number two, God is our master. He calls the shots. It's the same way with whatever you follow. If you follow your feelings, your feelings are your authority. Your feelings are your master. Your feelings call the shots. Second Peter 2.19b says this, For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Now, Peter is talking about this in the context of being enslaved to sin and false doctrine, but this principle is really true in any context if you think about it. Whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. If your emotions have conquered you, you're enslaved to your emotions. But if your flesh has been conquered by Christ and he has saved you, then you are enslaved to him. Romans 6.22 says, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. Being a slave of God is a wonderful thing, as any of my fellow slaves can tell you. <laughs> we tend to think of slavery in terms of American slavery in the antebellum South, which you know has very negative connotations, and rightly so. But when Paul says this in Romans about being slaves of God, his audience would have had a very different understanding of slavery than we do. In biblical times, people often sold themselves into slavery because of debt. Okay, if you got into debt and you couldn't pay it back, you were going to have people coming after you, you know, to throw you in jail or take your home and leave you homeless and indigent and starving and other terrible things like that. And selling yourself into slavery was a way to pay off your debt and at the same time ensure that you still had a home and food and clothing. 
and in many cases, masters educated their slaves, and a slave could work his way up in rank and authority in the household, and even eventually obtain his freedom if he wished. So what Paul is saying here is that God has come along, and at the cost of the life of his son, he has bought us out of the sin debt that was so huge that we could never repay it. A sin debt that we were about to be dragged off to the debtor's prison of hell for. And he has brought us into his home and cleaned us up and given us food and shelter and clothed us in the righteous royal robes of Christ. And not only that, he has made all of those riches eternally secure by adopting us into his family and making us his sons and daughters, joint heirs with Christ. That's our master, not some evil tyrant, but a good, loving, caring, providing God. Why would you not want to be a slave to that master? Because you're going to be a slave to something, either self or Christ, and Christ is a much better master. But the thing about a master-slave relationship is that the master is an authority over the slave. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. You are bought and paid for, my friend, if you belong to Christ. You don't work for the master of self anymore. Self doesn't get to boss you around anymore. You have a new master, Christ, and you do what he says now. And don't let that scare you, because when you traded self as master for Christ as master, you traded way up, okay? Because remember what we read in Jeremiah, your old master was deceitful and desperately sick and unknowable, but everything Christ tells you to do is good and right and perfect. Everything Christ tells you to do is for your good and his glory. Remember that stability that we were talking about that, that people just naturally crave? We were talking about that a minute ago. This is part of that stability. You never have to worry that the thing, whether the thing that God is telling you to do is, is the right thing or if it's the best thing for you. You can trust that it is every single time. And where do we find all of these things that God is telling us to do? That's right. We find them in his written word, the Bible. So we don't live by our emotions because they can be deceptive and untrustworthy. We live by God's word because he is our master. And then there's another very important reason for us to live by God's word instead of our emotions. And that is because living by God's word is the perfect example that Jesus set for us. So we're going to look at number three. Jesus is our example to follow. And we're going to be hanging out in Matthew 4 for a few minutes. If you want to turn there, we're going to look at Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. <clears throat> Matthew 4, 1 through 11. This is Jesus being tempted by Satan in the wilderness. So Matthew 4, starting at verse 1. Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Wouldn't you be? How many of y'all have ever fasted before? Either fasting and prayer, you were going to have a medical procedure and they told you not to eat for 12 hours or whatever. Okay. The longest I've ever intentionally fasted was 24 hours, and I thought I was going to die. I don't know if you're like me, but when I don't eat for an extended period of time, it's not just the physical hunger pangs. It kind of affects my clarity of thought, uh, my emotions, everything. So I can't even imagine how Jesus must have been feeling after 40 days of not eating. Verse 3, And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written. Now, before we move on to the next part of that verse, 
What did Jesus mean by that? It is written. Who wrote it? Where is it written? In, in the, it's, yeah, in the Bible, exactly. And just something else I'd like to briefly point out here. You'll notice that Jesus doesn't say, God told me. I heard a still small voice. God spoke to me in a dream and said, no, what does he say? He says, it is written, that's right. Why is that instructive to us? Because most of the time when people say those things to us, I just feel like God is saying to me or whatever, that is based on their feelings, which we've already said can be deceptive and wicked and untrustworthy, rather than the concrete, objective, black and white, incontrovertible, written word of God. It is written, Jesus said, verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Let me read that again. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What are we not to live by in this verse? Bread alone, right? Jesus felt hungry. Maybe he felt like giving up on this fast and eating something. Maybe he felt like he wanted some bread. But, he says, we are not to allow ourselves and our decisions to be controlled by our feelings. This is the example he's setting sort of secondarily in this, this passage. We are not to live by bread alone, but we are to live by what? Every word that comes from the mouth of God. And where do we find every word that comes from the mouth of God? In the Bible. It is written. Very good. Verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now, if you will allow me to indulge my inner archaeology nerd for just a moment, in Herod's temple, which is the temple that Jesus would have known, there was a pinnacle on one of the buildings in the temple complex which stood 300 feet above the bottom of the valley below it, the Kidron Valley. From the top of that pinnacle to the bottom of the valley is a drop almost equivalent to jumping off a 28-story building. From, from the tip to the bottom of the valley. Our state capitol in Baton Rouge um, has, well, I think it has about, excuse me, 30 floors, but you can go up to the 27th floor, uh, and there's an open-air observation deck, and you can walk, and walk around and look out across the city, across the Mississippi River and all that. And for someone like me who's afraid of heights, it is terrifying. <laughs> Jumping off the pinnacle of the temple would not have tempted me in the least. Now, the, the temple was the center of life in Jerusalem. There were always people around, especially the people who most antagonized Jesus, the scribes, the Pharisees, the priests. So what Satan is saying to Jesus here, what he's tempting him to do, is to throw himself off this basically 28-story building and trust that God would miraculously catch him on the way down and not let him fall to his death. And everybody would see that, and everybody would believe in him, especially the scribes and the Pharisees who were around. Now remember, Jesus is the author of Scripture. So he had already written Isaiah 53 about himself about 700 years before this moment, which says that he, Jesus, was despised and rejected by men. And of course, in addition to that, you know, as God, he's omniscient. So he, he already knows what he's in for. Rejection, hatred, people impugning his character and calling him names, people wanting to kill him. And so Satan is appealing to Jesus' desire to feel liked and accepted by doing something glamorous and sparkly. And maybe Satan's even appealing to Jesus' desire to take an easier way out for people to believe in him an easier way than scourging and a crown of thorns and a cross jumping off the temple and having angels catch you so you don't even strike your foot against a stone 
is certainly a lot easier and awesomer than the pain and the humiliation of a cross. But does Jesus give in to those feelings of, of wanting to be liked or wanting to take the easy way out and let those feelings determine his actions? No. Look at verse 7. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Okay, again, with it is written. His position is, I'm not going to test God that way. And by the way, since I'm God, you shouldn't be putting me to the test either. Okay, I'm not going to let my feelings or any sort of fleshly desires cause me to do something that I know is wrong. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain. What is it with the devil and heights? Okay. Uh, took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Who wouldn't want global power and the wealth that comes with it if it were offered to him? So Satan kind of comes at him with, you're the king, Jesus. You know, you're the king of kings and lord of lords. Doesn't that kind of king deserve to have the world, the whole world? As his kingdom forget about judgment day you know don't you deserve to have everyone respect you and bow down to you and obey you right now okay now as women just because of the way God has wired us a little bit differently from men we probably don't feel the weight of this quite as much as men would that temptation to feel powerful and feel respected can be much more impactful to men sometimes than it can to women. So men can be tempted to live by their feelings too, but they generally tend to be tempted a bit differently than, than we are emotionally. Verse 10, then Jesus said to him, be gone Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So again, one more time, it is written. Jesus is not going to give in to feelings and desires, no matter how tempting it might be. He is our perfect example of living by God's word instead of living by our emotions. So we started off the first seg this first segment with the question, why should we live by God's word instead of by our emotions? Because our emotions are deceitful and wicked and untrustworthy because God and his word are good and perfect and trustworthy. Because if we are in Christ, he is our master, not self. And we're to do what he says, not what our emotions say. And because Jesus not only tells us not to live by our emotions, he has set the perfect example for us by not living by his emotions, but by living by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Do you think those are good enough reasons to live by God's word instead of living by our emotions? Yeah, I would agree with that. All right, so now that we know why we should live by God's word instead of living by our emotions, how do we do that? Because that can be challenging at times. So how to live by God's word instead of our emotions. Number one, determine in your spirit that you're going to do it. In other words, make a non-emotional, objective, biblical decision that you're going to live by God's word instead of by your emotions. If you're like me, it helps to make a conscious decision to start doing something. Write it down. Tell your husband or your best friend. Even just say it out loud to yourself or in your prayer time. Um, remember in the Old Testament when something significant would happen and they would set up a memorial stone to remember it by. Familiar with that? Making that conscious decision is kind of like that. It's, it's something that you can point back to later when you're tempted to act on your emotions and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I made a decision to live by God's word, not by my emotions. So determine in your spirit that you're going to do it. Number two, pray. Ask God to help you. You know, so often we treat 
sanctification or growing in Christ likeness like it's a do it yourself project, you know? It's not. Sometimes we feel like if we really want to show our love for God, we have to prove it to him by obeying him in our own strength. But that's exactly the opposite of what God wants. God doesn't see you being strong and independent and pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps as successful. God sees you totally depending on him as successful. You don't have to attempt living by God's word or anything else in the Christian life by yourself. And you're not going to be able to do it anyway. Trust me, I've tried. So ask for God's help to live by his word when you're tempted to live by your emotions. That is a godly, righteous prayer. And God delights to answer the prayers of his children when they're asking him to help them be more godly. So be in prayer about this. Number three, identify your weaknesses. That's always fun, isn't it? When are you most likely to live by your emotions? A certain time of day, a certain time of the month, mm -hmm. in certain circumstances, with certain people. Which emotions are you most likely to be controlled by? Anger, love, sadness, fear, excitement, jealousy. This is going to take some introspection. So if you have trouble pinpointing your triggers, for lack of a better word, by just sitting and thinking about it, you might want to journal it. Carry around a little notepad or use the notes feature on your phone and make a note of the circumstances every time you feel tempted to let your emotions control you. Or, you know, you could sit down for a minute at night and think back over the day and write everything down then. Ask God to reveal to you your areas of weakness. Um, you could also maybe even ask your husband or a really close friend who will be honest with you. <laughs> ask what they see your weaknesses to be as far as choosing your emotions over God's word goes. The more clearly you can define a problem, the easier it is to deal with and to pray about it in a specific and efficient way, and the less monumental and impossible it seems to tackle it. Okay, so identify your weaknesses. Number four, you're going to love this, Debbie. Memorize scripture. No. Yes, yes, you can. I used to say I couldn't memorize too, but I started working on it, and I found a way that works for me. You just have to find a way that works for you. After a few years of practice, I have memorized 1 John, 2 Timothy, Jude, some of the Psalms, some other passages. Listen, I say that not to brag at all, but to say very humbly, if I can do it, anybody can do it, really. I, I really mean that. You just have to find a system that works for you. Think back to the passage that we just read about Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. The devil brought temptations to him. And how did Jesus combat those temptations? With memorized scripture, okay? What are some scriptures that you can think of that would be helpful to memorize so that when you're tempted to act on your emotions, you can recite that scripture to combat that temptation. Um, on your handout there, I've listed some general ones about not living by your emotions and living by God's word instead. But if you find that you're tempted to, to live by your emotions in a specific area, like eating to feel better, or feeling attracted to a man that you're not married to, or venting your anger to feel better, I would encourage you to find verses specifically about gluttony or lust or anger or whatever your particular area is and memorize those as well as those general ones. So memorize scripture. Number five, cut off your right hand, gouge out your right eye. And obviously, just for legal reasons, I do not mean this literally. <laughs> any more than Jesus meant it literally when he said in Matthew 5, 29 through 30, if your right hand causes you to sin, 
oh, excuse me, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. And another verse that goes along with that same line of thought is Romans 13, 14. It says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. In other words, get rid of anything that makes it easier for you to give in to temptation to sin. Rearrange whatever details of your life you need to in order to make it as difficult as possible for you to give in to temptation to sin. For example, let's say you're really into to news and politics, and that's what makes up most of your Facebook feed. And after you've scrolled through Facebook for an hour, you're just livid at the condition that the world is in, right? Who wouldn't be? And because you're livid at what's going on in the world, you start snapping at your family members to vent your frustration. That's living by your emotions. Living by God's word requires you to love and serve your family and to be patient and kind with them. So you need to gouge out that eye or cut off that hand and maybe either stop following those news and, and politics accounts or maybe you even need to get off Facebook completely if you can't stop allowing your emotions to control you like that. Another example, when you've had a really hard day at work, it makes you feel better to go shopping. And the, oh yes, I get a testimony over here. The mall is right on your way home from work. But your husband has asked you not to do that anymore because it's breaking the family budget, okay? Living by God's word in Ephesians 5, requires you to submit to your husband and not to go on those shopping trips anymore. But driving past that mall is really tempting. Your car just seems to just go in the parking lot all by itself. So drive home a different direction, okay? Going a couple of blocks out of your way is worth it to resist temptation, to obey God's word, and to show love and respect for your husband, all right? So, cut off that right hand, gouge out that right eye. Number six, make a plan ahead of time. How often do you respond really well and really godly when something unexpected happens? <laughs> or when you're not prepared for something? No, I'm not the only one. Good, good to know. Once you've identified your, your weaknesses and the situations that trigger you to give in to your emotions, sit down and make a plan for how to respond in a godly way the next time. It could be like what we just talked about with cutting off your right hand, gouging out your right eye. When I've had a bad day, I am not going to drive by the mall on my way home. Make that decision and just do it. Or when I feel like I'm getting frustrated by politics, I'm going to put down the Facebook machine and walk away from it. But it could also be something smaller and simpler, you know. When that lady at work makes me angry, I'm going to step out of the room for a minute until I can calm down and act in a godly way. Or when my kids are fussy and arguing and I feel like yelling, I'm going to take a deep breath, say my memory verse, and say a short prayer asking God to help me be patient. Here's something I do. I struggle, you're not going to believe this, and I'm sure none of you have ever experienced this before. I struggle with the temptation to argue the stupidest things right into the ground with my husband because I want to feel right. No? I want to feel like I have won. Mm-hmm. Can I get a witness? Uh-huh. And that's not right. And so what I started, <laughs> that's not right. Let's just get that. <laughs> what I started doing was every time I felt that temptation, I tried to remember to do this. Literally. And I mean I clamped down hard on the, the insides of my lips, so it's impossible for me to say anything. 
And I do that until that moment of, ment of temptation passes. And while I'm doing that, I'm saying a little prayer, asking God to help me to keep my mouth shut and to be godly in the situation. And I fail at that more times than I succeed. But it has helped. I think I'm growing in that area. And of course, then my husband figured out what I was doing. And I think he appreciates, that, you know, most of the time that I'm not saying whatever it was that I was going to say and that I'm trying to do the godly thing. So the idea is make a plan and work your plan, okay? If it's a recurring type of situation, like with the lady at work, you know, or your kids, you might even want to get someone to help you role play the godly response so, so that you can practice having the right response in advance. And I know that probably sounds silly, but it really, it really does help. The idea here is responding instead of reacting, okay? To just stop reacting out of emotion and instead take the time to make sure that you respond out of obedience to God's word, okay? And number seven, keep a record, okay? As you're beginning to work on living by God's word instead of living by your emotions, write all of this stuff down. And be sure to write the dates down too. Write down all these things that we've been talking about, your weaknesses and triggers to giving into your emotions, your little plans and strategies for dealing with temptation, the Bible verses that you're trying to memorize, the, the times that you sin and repent, and the times that you obey God and give him glory. And also all of your prayers about all of these things and how God answers you about those things. Write all this stuff down and write the dates down too. It'll help you to remember the things that you need to remember. And then also from time to time, you can go back over what you've written. And it'll help you to see how God is working in your life and how he has grown you. So write all these things down. Keep a record. Our hearts, the seat of our emotions, are deceptive and desperately sick and untrustworthy. We don't want something like that leading us through life. We want to be led by God's true, right, trustworthy word. And if we'll determine in our spirits that we want to live by God's word, if we will make no provision for the flesh but make plans for obedience, if we'll depend on Christ to help us every step of the way, he will grow us to greater Christ-likeness to live by his word and not by our emotions. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for forgiving us emotions, for allowing us to respond to things in emotional ways when it's godly and appropriate and we do it in a biblical way. But help us as we face the, the challenge of, of channeling our emotions in a biblical way and, and expressing them in a, a godly way. Help us to remember that you are our good and kind and loving master, but that you're still in authority over us and that we need to bow the knee to you and be obedient to you and live by your word instead of our emotions. Give us the strength and the endurance and the ability and the courage to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Michelle. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. All right. Well, let's go ahead and take another um, about 10 minute break um, for. Yes? I'll, I'll just take a few minutes. Okay. <laughs>